worship this morning with our next song called This Is A New. We did it um, recently, I think a couple of weeks ago, so it should be familiar to you. Just join us when you're done. I want to brag on this song a little bit. Well, the first time I heard it, of course, I get text messages from a uh, conservative individual. We won't say any names, Melissa. But, uh, <laughs> I get text messages all the time that says, Max, listen to this song. Now, I listened to this song, and it literally took me to my knees in tears. And it's such a powerful song just because of our scripture tells us so many times to be still. It's just that constant reminder that God is still on the move. He's still doing miraculous things. We're reminded of the fear of this craziness that's around us. But God is on the move. He's doing something special. This revival that we're having today is bringing us back together. That's something special. And that, that we're, that's something we can look forward to in the days ahead. So as we sing this, the fear of prayer. It's a special song. No sing loud. I expect you to listen. We hear you,
that reader, you also want to wait for the opportunity to be the best person, the best possible subject you can be. So I want to do something special right now. So I thought about how I'm going to do this for a long time. <laughs> but I'm going to introduce each one of you, and we'll start. We'll go out on the sorry ladies. Awesome. Matt and I did this on the fly, so uh, uh, Taylor and Eli. And so we hope that you'll read those. It's the message, so it's a really good translation, and it's one that's easy to read and understand. And so I hope that you all appreciate those. Well. Well. We ask for your wisdom and clear direction over 
Well, isn't technology fun? <laughs> okay, that's all right. Get this stuff off. I'm glad y'all are here. I'm glad you're here because, one, it's good to see you again. And uh, maybe it's a good thing that we're not live streaming because uh, we can just be ourselves. And there's no record except we're recording, and it won't show you, so nobody knows who's here. So your secret's safe. And, uh, and that's good, but it is good to see you. It's good to be here with you. We are continuing a series that I started several weeks ago on our identity in Christ. And every year, as I mentioned when I started the series, the elders decide what our mission mandate is going to be for that year. And the mandate is basically what we're going to focus on for the year. And for 2020, we want to focus on and realize our identity in Christ and what that means for us. And so I've been talking about that. In fact, I was thinking about it and looking back through my, my uh, folders on my computer and really ever since we've been a congregation for over eight years now, I've focused on that in some way, either in Bible study or in sermons that I've preached, things like that, to help us to, to have a better grasp of who we are in Christ. Because our identity really determines everything about us. I mean, if you think about it, where you come from, it determines who you are. I mean. We have a natural identity, right? I mean, we have parents, we were raised, we have certain DNA, we have certain uh, characteristics. And we, you know, we act like people in our family, whether we want to or not. Every day I act more and more like my father, and I don't want to do that sometimes, you know? Uh, it only is good qualities, of course. But, you know, we do that, and we'll say things, and we, we say them, and we think, ah, that's my mother. Happy Mother's Day, by the way. And so, so, you know, it's like that's how my mother would say that or my father would say that. And we do things because we have an identity and we grow into an identity based on how we're raised and those sorts of things. But we also have an identity that's given to us in Christ when we trust in Christ. And that identity, I would say, over the course of our lives begins to replace the identity we have genetically or biologically or those sorts of things. Because we are now to act out of who we are in Christ, that new identity that we have as sons and daughters of God. Now, I want to clarify something that I said last week at the end of the sermon. I went back and watched this week and realized that I might have been a little bit un 
clear as to what I was saying, or I, I didn't explain it well enough. And I stated that the, the way of knowing whether we're living according to the flesh or living according to the spirit is we ask ourselves this question, are my actions, my feelings, my thoughts, are they all about me? Or are they all about Jesus? Now, I said that, and that's kind of a pious statement. You know, it's kind of a very religious statement in a way. And as I reflected on that, I thought, well, this might be a little bit misleading because you could take that to say that whatever we do, if it's not about Jesus, then we shouldn't be doing it. So, ladies, when you go get your manis and petties, that's all about you. And that's okay. There are things that we do for ourselves that's fine. And it's not living according to the flesh. It's just, it's living our life and caring for ourselves. We should take care of ourselves. And that's not wrong. That's not something we shouldn't do. But I wanted you to understand that God wants us to enjoy life. Now, that doesn't mean life is going to be easy. And that doesn't mean that you're always going to have happy times. But it means that if you're enjoying life, it isn't because necessarily you're living according to the flesh. You may be enjoying life because the Spirit is leading and you're enjoying God's great creation and all the things that he's done for you and all the things and gifts that you have in your life. And that's wonderful to do. And so we should do those things. I want you to recognize that it's not all about God and none about you either. So how you live your life, you live it as yourself, as the Holy Spirit infused in you lives with you. And so that's what we want to do. I want to ask you, and this kind of gets back to last week, but it also springboards into this week, is the question we ask is why, but really the why question gets at what is our motivation for doing what we do? Why do you do what you do? Think about it. You can say, well, I go to work because I have to have a paycheck. All right, that's one thing. All right. Why do, you, why do you do the things that you do? Why do you act the way that you act? Why do you think the way that you think? Those motivations are what helps us to understand. Why do you want to self-improve? What is it about you, the flaws that you perceive that you want to correct? Why do you do the religious things that you do? See, it all comes down to why. It comes down to our motivation. And remember, we are called to do one thing. You remember what that one thing is? Tell me what that one thing is. To love as Jesus loves you. That is our one thing. And so that's what we're supposed to be doing. Jesus willingly died for you to bring about your complete forgiveness. The power of God that raised Jesus from the dead gave us life. We have that life now. The Spirit indwells all believers to comfort, instruct, and in fact pray for us when we don't know what we're doing. All that God did was to bring about this good into our lives. Everything that he did for us was to bring about this good. So are we doing what we do to benefit someone else? Do we care for people because we want to care for them because it's what Jesus asked us to do or mandated us to do? Or are we doing it because we want to get a pat on the back? We want some recognition in some way. Do we do what we do for us so we get a sense of satisfaction or do we do it for the benefit of the other person? Now, here's the thing. Whenever we do something good for someone else, we get the benefit, don't we? We get a benefit. It feels good to care for other people. It feels good to, to help someone in need. But the point is, what is our goal and purpose in doing it? If it's just for us, then it's really living by the flesh. But is it, if it's so that Christ can be glorified, Christ can be lifted up, then it's by the Spirit. I hope that clears it up. If it doesn't, it's the best I can do. And uh, you can just ask me later or whatever, and I'll try to do better. Now, when it comes to our identity, we are, we are the children of God. When we were born physically, we were born children of Adam. We were created in Adam's image, as Genesis tells us. But then when we were reborn, we were reborn into God's image. We're the image bearer of the one who gave us spiritual birth which means that we are new creations we are spiritually alive so why do we still sin okay again back to that question from last week last week i said that one of the reasons we still sin is because of the flesh the flesh is this thing that causes us to think differently and the flesh is a way of thinking 
Remember I said last week that the only part of us that was made new when we came to Christ was our spirit. And we are three parts. We are body, soul, and spirit. Our body is the physical aspect of who we are. Our soul is our emotions, the way we think, the way we, we feel. So those parts have not been regenerated. Those parts were not made new when we were saved. In fact, our bodies won't be made new until we hit heaven. But daily, our minds are being renewed. Our soul is being renewed by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God. And so as that begins to change, then the old programming that we have left over from where we were in Adam begins to be replaced with the new programming, if you will, of being in Christ. So the other enemy that we have, along with the flesh, is this thing called sin. Sin is not you, but it influences you. You are not a dirty, rotten sinner. I don't care how bad you are or think you are. I don't care what you did today, yesterday, or years previous. You are not a dirty, rotten sinner. Now let's look at what Paul said in Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. He said, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present, members, but present yourself to God as those alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. Now, Paul says some very interesting things in this passage. He says, look, don't let sin reign over you or master, be the master of you or to control you. And in this word or in this text, when we think of the word sin, we often think of it as a verb. Okay, you high school seniors, what is a verb? Acts and words. You're not a high school senior, Trudy. I'm not. Oh. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. No, I, that's right. Just two years. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So we think of sin as a, as a verb. It's an action. It's a thing we do. It's, a, it's something that we, we participate in. But here's the thing. There's a wonderful book out called Vine's Expository Dictionary of New and Old Testament Words. And in there, he gives a second meaning to this word sin. And he says, sin is a governing power that operates through the members of our body. So, Vines is asserting that this governing power carries people-like characteristics. Sin is people-like, but here sin is a noun, not a verb. It's not an action, but a thing. God is telling us that there is a power called sin that acts through our bodies. In Romans 6 and 7, you remember those wonderful uh, chapters in Romans where Paul tells us that sin is housed within our bodies and that cause him to do the things he doesn't want to do and doesn't allow him to do the things that he wants to do and that back and forth that, that Paul had with himself and with this thing called sin. Well, he says that sin is not you. Sin is something that influences you. Sin is something that is always trying to have reign over you. So let, there are three verses that I want us to look at and it kind of puts all of this together. So the first is Romans six twelve. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Romans seven seventeen. So now no longer am I the one doing it but sin which dwells in me. And then Romans seven twenty. But I am doing the very thing I do not want. I am no longer the one doing it but sin which dwells in me. Now, Paul is not saying the devil made me do it. I have no responsibility here. Not my fault. Yes, I did that bad thing, but it isn't me. It's not, you know, sorry. Go after sin. Go find sin and, and take it out on it. That's not what he's saying at all. What he's saying, though, is that there is a, something called sin that motivates him sometimes to do the things that he doesn't want to do and to not allow him to do the things that he wants to do. And here's another part that Paul was making at the end of chapter 6, or end of verse 14, when he says, anytime you build your life on law-based religion and you try to give it your best shot, you're going to fail. God introduced the law so that we might discover the presence of this entity called sin. Go back to the Garden of Eden for a minute. Adam and Eve were put in this garden and they were given free reign over everything in it. 
God said, enjoy it, have fun, knock yourselves out. But now there's one tree, the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Just leave it alone. Just leave it alone. Well, what did Adam and Eve run to? <laughs> the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because when we're told something we can't have, what do we want? The thing we can't have, right? So somebody please tell me. I, no, that's the wrong analogy. I was going to say somebody tell me I can't have chocolate. <laughs> think people have. Uh, <laughs> all, all right, so there's got to be a better analogy, but I'm just not going to come up with it. But, but here's the thing. Adam and Eve had the choice to either go and pick the fruit and partake of it or not. God said, everything is in this garden is yours. Just enjoy it. But just don't go to that tree. The one thing they went to was that tree. Sin influenced them to do the very thing that, that God said don't do. And we know what the consequences of that was, right? I mean, they were banished from the garden and couldn't go back into it again. And that's what happens with us. There's this entity called sin that is impressing upon us, encouraging us, tempting us, wanting us to do the very thing that we know is not right for us to do. And as last week I said that, you know, when we walk according to the flesh, it brings death. Walking according to the spirit brings life. When we walk according and, and we allow the Spirit to have reign or power over us, it doesn't bring physical death, but it brings death in the sense that there is no benefit to you and I for doing it. It doesn't make you better. It doesn't make you smarter. It doesn't make you have peace. But when we walk by the Spirit, Paul said we have peace and joy. So when we let the Spirit have control and reign, when we choose to let the Spirit do that, then it's not death that we're receiving but we're receiving peace i mean think about it when we live our lives according to the spirit we're doing the right things we're listening is there any guilt or shame in your life is there any unease no you're at peace why because your life is infused with god's life and you are living according to his spirit in you and so that gives you that sense of peace and it gives you joy you don't have to worry about what you might have done you don't have to worry about consequences because there aren't any, because you're walking according to the Spirit. I want to read you a, a section from a guy by the name of Andrew Farley. He says this a lot better than, than I could. I was going to summarize it for you, but then as I, I read through this, I just felt like it would be better if I just read what he wrote. It comes from a book called God Without Religion. He says if we choose law religion, it will inevitably draw us draw excuse me, dawn on us, no, no matter how hard I try, I find that I'm addicted to sin. The power of sin thrives under the law. But in God's wisdom, he caused us to die to the law, and we therefore simultaneously die to sin. The heart surgery we receive at salvation cuts our ties with sin and allows us the freedom to finally choose something else. But if we don't understand what happened to us at salvation, we may mistake the message of sin for our old self. Instead of calling ourselves critical spirits, we need to recognize that the critical thoughts are coming from sin. Instead of calling ourselves dirty or perverted, we need to know that lustful thoughts have an organized power called sin as their source. Instead of calling ourselves or others gossips, we can realize that it's the sin principle within, within that would have us act in such a way. Recognizing the source of temptation is a big deal. It enables us to see how we can be new creations at the core, but still struggle with sin. It also helps us understand why a rule-based religion always results in failures as it only excites this power called sin. We're meant to be motivated by grace from deep within our human soul. So here's the thing. Our enemy, flesh and sin, will always war with us. They will always try to get you to walk according to the flesh. And remember, the flesh, there's good flesh and bad flesh, but there's, it's flesh. Flesh will do anything it can to get us to fulfill some need in our lives. It will get us to make us, want us to, to look better, feel better, think better, act better, those sorts of things. But mainly it's about getting what we want so that we can feel good about who we are. And one of the things about this old identity that we have 
that was given to us in Adam and sometimes from our DNA and our, our, our biology is that we may not have been raised perfect. Any of you in here raised perfectly? You better raise your hand, Christy. <laughs> I knew that had to be there. Joan, I, I, we knew it whether she raised her hand or not. But, you know, we're raised certain ways. And it causes us to think and act and do things a certain way. You know, I was raised in a household where I was never encouraged. Never encouraged at all. And I was thinking about it the other day. Monday, I went down to play golf in Corinth, Mississippi with my brother. And to try to get back to some sense of normalcy and to, to really... Just get out with my brother. Since our other brother had died, and we hadn't had really had a good chance to talk and that sort of thing. And so as I was going down, I was thinking about my father and how he raised us. My father was a good man. He worked two jobs, but he worked all the time. And because of that, he was tired all the time. And because of that, maybe not just that, he was kind of a, a mean fella. He could be grumpy. And uh, he could be harsh at times. But as I reflected on that, he wasn't harsh all the time. He just was harsh sometimes. And, and I would say it was because, you know, it was because I messed up, all right? And, uh, he, did it on, he did it for a reason, and I deserved it sometimes. But he could be very harsh and cruel. And then I began to think about, is that who I am? Is how he treated me and treated my brothers and my mother, is that how I am? Is that who I am? I hadn't asked Beth this question. <laughs> I don't really want to know the answer. Um, but I hope not. Because, you know, you can see, you can see the deficiencies of your parents. And, and as one person said uh, one time, he said, every parent at best is a failure. At best, you're a failure. Think about that. We all want to be the best parents we can be, but we make so many mistakes with our children. We don't want to make those mistakes. We just do because we don't have the manual. And every child, every child is different. <laughs> We're all different. And so what I did as I was riding down to Corinth to, to see my brother, as I thought about this, there was just this tremendous sense of peace and calm that came over me. And I don't know, maybe I've been holding on to some of the, the negatives of my, my childhood. I don't know. But then I started thinking, I had a wonderful childhood. I, it was fun. We had nothing. We were poor, but it didn't matter. We didn't care. We played outside all day. We went to the forest. We, we did all kinds of stuff. We dug holes in the ground for no reason. I mean, we, <laughs> we just did stuff. We were kids, and it was fun. But here's, here's the point. I could let how my father treated me dictate how I treat everybody else. I could be grumpy. Maybe I am. I could be harsh. Maybe I am. I hope not. I could do all sorts of things, and you can do the very same thing. Every one of us was raised differently, and we have, we have baggage we carry along with us. We can let that be our identity, and that's what Satan wants for us. He wants us to, to only focus on the negatives of where we're from, the negatives of our, our, our lives, and the baggage that that brought, and then to dwell on that. And that's not what God wants for you. You are a new creation. You have a new identity in Christ. You are no longer in Adam. You're in Christ. And that's why Paul said, don't let sin reign over you. Don't let sin have control over you. Because you don't have to. You are righteous from the core of your being. And that means regardless of how you were raised, regardless of your DNA, regardless of your biology, regardless of your circumstances, that doesn't matter because you are in Christ. And if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. And all of that other stuff is just baggage that you'll have to deal with over the course of your life. Because you are righteous, do righteousness, not unrighteousness. Sin wants to control you because you are new, a new creation. But Paul says sin has no mastery over you. Look, no one ever said this life would be easy. If anyone ever told you that if you'll just come to faith in Christ, all your problems will go away, they lie if that's what they tell you. In fact, life gets harder. It really does get harder because now you have choices to make. 
where when you were in Adam, there were no choices. You just did what you wanted to do and did, dealt with whatever the consequences. But now that we are in Christ, we have a choice of how we act, what we think, what we do. And we can choose righteousness because that is what God wants us to do. Toby Mack wrote a song called Scars. And I think this was after his son last year committed suicide. And he said that in this life, you will have scars. You, no one escapes planet Earth without scars of some form or another. We're all going to have them. But John reminds us in 1 John 4 for this. He says, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's who you are. That's your identity. Jesus came to give you new life, but he came to give you an identity that is secure and it doesn't fluctuate. It doesn't matter who mom and daddy or cousins or sisters or brothers are. It only matters who he is. And he says, you're mine. You're holy and righteous. You're mine forever. I'll never be mad at you. There's nothing you can do to separate me from you. You're not a dirty, rotten sinner. You're my child. You are a saint. But as those who have overcome the world by the power of Christ in us, yes, the flesh and sin will be our constant adversary until we die. But they are not you. You are a beautiful child of God. That is your identity. Live from that identity, not anything else. When the flesh or sin comes to condemn you and to get you to do or say or think or feel a certain way, think of your identity in Christ. That is the identity that, has, that overrides everything. What God says about you is the most important thing that could be said about you. So don't allow anything to take that from you. Not sin, not flesh, not the devil. The power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, and you don't have to succumb to it. Not only that, that's why we have each other. We can pray for each other. We can hug each other. I didn't say that. We can hug each other. Maybe not right now, but at some point we can give virtual hugs. You know, we can, we can pray. We can do all sorts of things to, to help each other out. We need one another. And we need one another to remind us of who we are, the identity that we have because of Jesus Christ. If you're a child of God, that means something. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for this new identity that you've given us. It is not one that will ever be tainted. It's one that will not ever change. It's one that our actions can't affect. It is from you for us by the power of Christ. You have infused your spirit with our spirit through the Holy Spirit. You never leave us. You never harm us. But you're always there encouraging us. And we thank you for that, that voice, that, that soft voice that continually whispers in our minds and our ears to look to you, to remember who you are, to not let this world taint you, to not be consumed with what others think about you or say about you. Only live from what God says about you. And you are his. In Jesus' name, amen.
Right.